Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Orientation. This is session 72. I'm going to start off right where we left off discussing the policy of evil. And the one thing that I want you to have down in your mind is this. That the primary goal of the policy of evil is not to get you to drop out of church. It is not to get you to sin. It is not to get you to go back into the world. It's not to do those things. The primary goal of the policy of evil is to keep you from becoming a fully educated son. That is the primary goal of the policy of evil. I'm not saying it won't utilize the world to accomplish that. It will. But what it's after is to make sure that this assembly eventually shuts down and disintegrates like so many other sonship assemblies before us have done. And by the way, that's one of the things that's a little bit frightening for any pastor that has an assembly taking through the sonship curriculum because the history has been that they have been victimized by the policy of evil at some point. And, and, and there were more before, and, and some of those have just been destroyed. So, but not all of them, and there are some others that are still operating in the country, and we're certainly glad for that. Now, one of the ways that the policy of evil is going to do this is to produce a counterfeit godliness. Now, again, just so that we have it, in, and I know I've said this to you over and over, but when you talk about godliness, or you talk about something that's godly, do not confuse that with something that's righteous. If it's righteous, we think of good works as righteousness. But when you're talking about godliness, you have to keep in your mind you're talking about three components. You're talking about being educated to think like your Heavenly Father thinks, to do things His way because He has a way that He's doing it. Now I know before we talked about think, live, and labor, and that is the shortcut to that. But I want you to understand that living, it's not just living like Him, it's actually doing things His way. And the last one, of course, is to labor with Him. And that labor is going to take place now and in eternity. All right, now, always think of godliness that way. When you see Paul talking about godly edifying, edifying, Root word, edifice. It's a building. If you're being edified, you're being built up, right? So godly edifying, when you think of godly edifying, you're being built up in godliness. That's what the policy of evil is after. That's what it is not going to sit idly by and let take place without some kind of opposition. And you need to also understand that the policy of evil will carry that out because there's something about... Somebody tell me, just, just so that we understand. We talked about those two major oppositions. And we did a lot of work on the evil man. And we started that work on the strange woman. Somebody tell me, what is the evil man? That's the world. That's the one that you come in contact with first. And if it knocks you out of the saddle... Satan will never engage in his policy of evil against you. doesn't need to because the objective got met. But later, there's going to come a time when you're going to encounter the strange woman. And what is the strange woman? The policy of evil. And you'll see it abbreviated in your notes. I'm not talking about Edgar Allen. I'm talking about the policy of evil. And, the, and, and when you come into contact with that, what is it that makes the policy of evil different what is it that makes the strange woman different from the evil man? What's the difference? Yeah, there's a religious aspect to this strange woman. And you're going to find, as we read about her in Proverbs, she has a house. She has a house. What does that mean? She has a place where she carries on, doesn't she? She has somewhere where she's actually doing this thing that she's doing it. In today, now listen, with Israel, I, you can identify it with Israel. 
I'm, going to just, I'm just going to say this. Because she is religious, if you're going to work the policy of evil, just pretend for a moment that you're the adversary. You're, you're Satan. If you're going to carry out the policy of evil, where is the place you want that to be at work? In the church. Exactly. You want that to be at work in a church. And so the way to do that, if your primary goal is to stop the godly edification, to stop the sonship of, of anybody, then what would you do in a church? Whew, that's good. You would make it entertaining, wouldn't you? You know what? You would, you would include a whole lot of things except one. That. And as long as you're busy doing all these other things, and by the way, that's why people get used to the way those things work. See, I grew up in the Baptist church, so here's the way I know that a church service is supposed to go. You're supposed to have an opening hymn. Usually sometime during that opening hymn, everybody turns around and shake hands, and then you have, close that hymn off, and then you have an opening prayer, and then everybody sits down, and then you may have somebody that makes some announcements, and then you have some, you know, a time when everybody sings, and then you might have a special, and, and then you might, and, and, you know, and then you have the sermon, and then you have the invitation, and then you have the, I mean, you've all been in services like that. You understand what I'm talking about. And if it ever deviated from that whatsoever, immediately in your mind you thought, well, well, this isn't church. This isn't church. But the truth of the matter is, and you need to come to grips with this, is that when God created the local church and gave a pastor the commission to, to take his people through the sonship education, what you're doing right here and now is what church was intended to be. What we've gotten used to in this country is the thing the policy of evil has put together that does everything but that. Now, I'm not saying any of those things they're doing are evil. You understand that. What I'm saying is they are replacements for the one thing we are supposed to do. And when you look through your Bible... And you're going, to have to, you're going to have to begin to see your Bible just this way. Oh, let me just see if I can prime your thinking a little bit. Do you think when God created the local church, He knew how He wanted that thing to function? Okay? And if He had a way He wanted to function, do you think that He had a design ministry already in mind for that local church? Okay. Then if that's true, and do you think... That when God looked at that and designed this local church's ministry, do you think he left out any key important points? No, he did not. And you know all of that. Now, I'm going to pick on something. I've done it as a kid. I've had them in churches I pastored before. It's not an evil thing. But what I'm going to show you is the example of how this gets turned around. What is not told to you as a part of the ministry of the local church, and I could name one of a hundred things here, but here's the deal. Let's have vacation Bible school. Anything wrong with vacation Bible school? No, there's anything wrong with vacation. I used to go, I had to go to vacation Bible school. Not only did I have to go, when they had verse memorization, five verses a day for five days, I had to memorize them all. I would, my mom was not going to let me show up if I didn't know those verses. And I was going to show up. And I was going to say them. And it didn't kill me. I'm not saying that. This is not my way of getting back and having to go to vacation Bible school and memorize verses. But what I'm telling you is, did you find the instruction to do that in the, in your, in the Bible where the ministry of the church is laid out? No. And so here's my point. Well-meaning... I'm just going to give everybody the benefit of a doubt. Well-meaning pastors in an attempt to do something spiritual in the lives of not just adults, but also children in their congregations have no problem at all engaging in something that your Bible, which does contain the total ministry of the local church, never said one peep about. 
talk about sonship, if you're talking about godly edifying, they will fight that tooth and nail, and that's the only thing that is in there. Do you see what I'm saying? Why? Because they're bad people? No, that's not the case. It's because the policy of evil has become so pervasive that now it's the rule. And anything that varies from that rule is the exception. That's why you would be looked at as you're part of a cult. Because you're not like everybody else. But you're going to learn, thank God, we're not like everybody else. Because the policy of evil has been very successful. And so what you're going to find out, by the way, and I don't know if this is going to make any sense to you, but, you know, now today we're a little bit down, and I realize probably because of Mother's Day and work and a combination of things. But, you know, here's the thing. We really can't get a whole lot bigger than we are. If everybody shows up, if everybody's here, we can't get too much bigger. It's not because we don't have room. Do you know why? Yeah, because then we're not going to be able to really function with this interactive learning the way that we're supposed to. If we had 200 people in here, i got to tell you, that would be way beyond my ability to carry this on. Yes, I can still stand up here and say it, but there would be no way. What would I do if I look out, and it seems to me about 85 of those people don't have a clue what we're doing. What does that do to this then? Do I hold everybody up until we get... The, you, you, you understand? This is a really good group because I'm able to look out here and we are able to have discussion. We are able to interact and learn. We, we do all of that. But, but the point is, when you get, in fact, I'm going to tell you honestly, I think when you get up above 75, you're really pushing it. You just need somebody that's going to be better at it. If, if, if it could be done, it's got to be by a fully educated son because I certainly wouldn't have the ability to do that. Because on my end, I've got to be able to look out and read where this group is. I've got to be able to do that. And, and with more people, it's harder. Someone said to me one time when some church was having a problem, uh, up back in when I was in Granbury, it was a big church. And, and then, you know, they had a big split. You know what? They all go to other churches, right? And they said, and, and I was pastor in Glen River Chapel, and they said, don't you wish you could pick up about 100 of those people? And I went, no. <laughs> no. Because those people aren't interested in doing what we're doing. Now, I'd be glad to pick up anybody that's genuinely interested. But you know what the good part of this is? If you don't really want that sonship education, this is too much to endure. That's really a good thing, isn't it? I'm going to go up there and listen to that guy for two hours. Oh. In fact, just say one hour to most people and they'll go, an hour? That's their response to that. The fact that you come for two makes you weird. Okay? Now, to get, to get ourselves on track here, I'm going to take you over to 1 Timothy, and I want to show you this very thing that we've been talking about here. Paul, now remember, Timothy's a pastor, and, and, and Paul is educating him, and, and it's in these pastoral epistles you really find out about the policy of evil. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord, Je and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, I want you to understand, that's a, you would look, someone would look at that and say, well, that's kind of narrow, and it's supposed to be narrow, that they teach no other doctrine. No, by the way, let, let, me just, let me explain this for a second. I don't want someone on the DVD to misunderstand this. As you're studying through the sonship education, have you learned anything about the covenants? Did we go back and look at the covenants? Mm -hmm. Have you learned about other things back in not only Israel's program, but also in this dispensation of grace. When I'm talking about the sonship education, we're not talking about, 
only just taken one little sliver of the Bible, you know what that sonship education requires for you to know? That book. That's what it requires for you to know. But, what we're, but the way to do it God's way is to teach that book in that framework. Rather than just jumping over here and let me teach you about God's omniscience and let me teach you about, you know, uh, fasting and then jump over here and teach you about... You learn all that within the framework. By the way, since... Well, I hate to... I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail, but I mentioned fasting. Do you understand why, since I said it, I'll take an opportunity to give it to you. Do you know why God taught Israel to fast and pray? There's a very important issue here. And I don't know that I've ever heard a preacher get it right. Because I was brought up in a church with people who say, well, now if you really want to get your prayers answered, you fast and pray. And they go back to that deal, remember, where Je back to Israel's program where Jesus said, this kind, they couldn't cast out that devil, remember? And Jesus said, this kind, time, kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. So then we thought, oh, well, then what we've got to do is we've got to fast if we really want to do it. And I got on that bandwagon and I taught that stuff. But you know what? That's Israel's doctrine. That's doctrine. The one thing you can't do is take their doctrine. But there is a reason that God told them to fast and pray. First of all, in their program, do you, in fact, really in every program, prayer is really supposed to be focused where? Okay, I knew when I asked that question that way you would say that. I, I, and that's the right answer. We're focused on God. But when you're praying, really, who is it that you're praying for? I mean, where is the real focus? Is it all about you or is it about others? I mean, you find lots of things in the Scripture. It doesn't mean you can't pray for yourself, but really, you're interceding for others, right? If prayer is supposed to be let's just say it this way, inclusive of others. What is the fasting for? There was a group in Israel they were never supposed to forget about. They were always supposed to remember them. In fact, you even find exhortations about this, and if you don't know this, you may look at that and go, why are they even talking about that right there? Acts 15. Acts 15. I'm not going to get so far off track we won't get this done. But I want to show you this. In Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas had been carry on ministry in Antioch. And what's happened, I think it's Antioch or Tarsus, now I can't remember. Anyway, they're carrying on ministry there and Gentiles are getting saved. And what happens is some guys from Jerusalem came up and saw those Gentiles getting saved. And you know what they said? If these people don't get circumcised, they can't be saved. And Paul was arguing, of course, they don't have to be circumcised to be saved. But the Judaizers, you know what they were thinking of? They were thinking of the law. They were saying, well, yeah, they do. So there rose this big, big dispute about it. So you know what they decided? Take this back to the apostles at Jerusalem and let's let them rule on it. Now, if I'm Paul, I'm nervous about that. You know why? God gave me the mystery, not them. But fortunately, God has been at work showing them some things. And so I want you to look now in Acts 15, and you can see, verse 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now there's the issue. As you read on down, it says, let's see, and verse 4, well, verse 2 says they determined to go to Jerusalem and ask the apostles their question. Verse 4, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. See, this is a message. That church at Jerusalem, that church at Jerusalem, what is that church? You have more than one kind of church in your Bible. What is this church? Somebody identify this church for me. At Jerusalem, this is a Jewish, a group of Jewish believers, yes? And what gospel did they believe? The gospel of the kingdom. That is a group of the, look, 
The little flock. And if you're asking about what kind of church, you could say... It's a messianic church. They believe that Jesus is the Christ, right? Now because of that, do they have a background in the law? Well, sure, they had a background in the law. So you've got these folks saying that. But I want you to look at what the apostles actually rule. Even though some of the Pharisees said, oh yeah, they've got to keep the law of Moses. And, and verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. Now, Peter's already had the thing with Cornelius happen, and so God's already been cluing him in. There's been a program change here. Uh, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now wherefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That's true about the law, isn't it? Why are you going to put this on them? You know, we couldn't do that. He says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now get through, and then I want you to look down here at... I say I'm going to take you down here. Let's go to... Oh, I guess I went too far here. Verse 22. Oh, I'm sorry, 19. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication, and from thing, things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. And then, it, and then what they did is they sent people back with Paul, and they got that whole thing straightened out. All right, now, here's, here's the issue. Oh, there was one other thing. And that they remember, uh, you know what, it's going to be somewhere else in this passage. He's going to say to them, and this is the part I was after. And that you, I know it's in there. Remember the poor. Where is that? And Paul says, and they said, remember the poor. And then Paul says, which we were more than happy to do. He's actually going to comment on that. Okay, 28. It seemed good the Holy Ghost to us to lay no greater burden. Abstain from 29, from, from blood, from things strangled. And when they dismissed, they came to Antioch. Somewhere in this passage, I'll have to find it. All right, don't let, me, don't let me take up any more time with this. Let me just say that when he says to them, remember the poor, which Paul is going to come and say, which we were more than glad to do. Why the poor? Why the poor? Remember the poor. By the way, if you're praying and fasting, when you're fasting, what are you not doing? Not eating. You're not eating. And if you're poor, what are you not doing? Not you're not eating. You know what fasting was, was about? Putting yourself in the position of a particular group in Israel. The poor. It was supposed to make you think that is what this... That's what that's like for them. And if you know it's like that for them, what are you then motivated to do? To give, right? And to help them. Where did those poor people assemble themselves? Outside the temple, right? And they would, and they would give to the poor. Now, here's the last question. Why... Remember the poor. The world reads these verses in here and they think we've got to be charitable and give to the poor. That's what, that's what we're supposed to do. That, 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 you know, it, it's just good humanity. That's all they see it as. God has something else in mind. He put this in Israel. Go to Matthew 25. He put this in Israel from the very beginning. Matthew 25. He put this in Israel from the very beginning. And 
And I'm going to... And I'm going to give you the verse in just a second, but right now just 25. Does anybody want to take a stab at this? Why in the world did God establish for them from the very start, remember the poor? Remember that gospel of the kingdom when you tell the rich young ruler, go and sell all you have and give the money where? To the poor. And you'll like, come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. You've got this poor issue all the time. Ooh... To carry that a little further. She said, I'd be identified, someone on the tape said, what'd she say? She said, to be identified with them? Well, to be identified with who? Well, ooh, ooh, back up just a little bit. Right here. Who's going to be poor out here in the day of wrath? The little flock. And you know what? The Gentiles' entrance on the kingdom is determined based on what? On how they helped the remnant. How they helped the little flock. Look at Matthew 25, 34. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And behold Him, He gathered all nations. He'll separate them one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he'll set the sheep on His right hand, the goats on the left. Then shall the king say to them on His right hand, Come, you blessed to My Father. Now who did He gather before Him? All what? Nations. Who is this? This is Gentiles, isn't it? Yes. So here's what he's going to say. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, you gave me meat. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. In prison, you came unto me. Then there's the righteous answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink and all this stuff? And what is he going to, what is he going to say to them? Verse 40, The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto... One of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. The whole thing was in Israel's program from the start because there is a day when the true Israel is going to be as poor as church mice. Why are they going to be hungry in the day of wrath? Why are they going to be hungry? Because if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Why, why are they going to be thirsty? Because they're going to be drip. Remember, they're going to scatter everywhere. They're going to be out in those mountains. And there's not going to be any water. There's two ways they're going to get fed. One of them, manna is going to come. And God's going to feed them by manna. What's the second one? People. Gentiles are going to look at that and they're going to go, but let me give you a modern day analogy. Now I know it's dispensation of grace. It's not a Bible doctrine, but look. Do you remember when Nazi Germany was going to do what they were going to do to everybody that didn't fit the Aryan race mold, the Jews especially? Were there ever any Germans who at the peril of their own lives sheltered those Jews? You better believe it. And that's exactly what's going to happen out in the day of wrath. The only difference is it's not just Jews in general. It's the little flock in particular. And the second thing is the Gentiles that do that are going to get to enter into the kingdom. That's the basis for that. And God is setting all of this up to say, I want you to do prayer and fasting. Because when you're not eating, you're going, have you ever fasted for a day? Longest I ever fasted was for three days and th three 24-hour periods in a row. I fasted for three days. And here's what I found out. The first day, when you're driving down the road, you see every billboard that has food on it. In fact, it didn't even have to have food on it. It just needs to say something that reminds you of food. It may say, have a good day. Have a good day. Days get words. So does dog. Hot dog. That sounds good. Whoa. I'd love to have a hot dog. I mean, that's all you need, right? And, the first, and, and just don't eat and all you can think about You'll forget about those days you went in and opened the fridge and you went, nothing looks good. You'll be looking at that fridge going, yeah, it all looks great. The second day, you get a headache. Because your body's starting to push out all those poisons and all that stuff and you start getting a headache. And if you drink Cokes like I did back then, it's starting to get rid of all that caffeine. Oh, just kill me. 
About the end of the third day, you're not near as hungry as you were before. Do you know why? Because by the end of the third day, your body has switched from taking what you've eaten and putting in your stomach to now going, all those fat stores that are in your body, we're going to switch over and we're going to start utilizing those things. That's what happens on the third day. And I have to tell you, the third day, I wasn't near as hungry as I was the first day. And the second day, my head hurt so bad, it was almost enough for me to justify going back to eating. Now, I'm not suggesting you do that because actually, fasting is an Israel thing. That's my point here. Fasting is an Israel thing. But you know what was supposed to make, if it was done properly, it was supposed to remind them of those who did not have and they were poor. Have you ever heard of people fasting from things other than food even? All of that is supposed to be geared to make you think, what if I didn't have this? Then it makes you think, when I see somebody in that condition, I really remember what that's like and I want to help them. And God wants that proper thinking operating because one day the little flock is going to be out there totally dependent on that and he wants that to have been in place all the way through this program. Now you understand something about fasting and prayer and what that was supposed to produce. But to get ourselves kind of back on track with all of that, let's keep going through this, this, this verse here, that they teach no other doctrine. It doesn't mean you're not learning the other things in the Bible. You're learning them, though, within the framework of godly edifying. Neither give heed to fables. Somebody identify for me what are these... I know we're not studying this yet. We will get to Timothy one day <laughs> if we live long enough. What are the fables? They're not identified for you here. He just uses the word. Does anybody know what those are? The fables are taking the miracles of Israel's program and acting like God's doing them in the dispensation of grace. And here he refers to them as fables. He's not talking about Aesop's fables. He's talking about trying to make God do things that were back in Israel's program. Here's the next one. Endless genealogies. You might know what that is. You know what genealogies are, right? Tradition. Well, those genealogies are all those, you know, who's in the line of who and all this kind of bit. You know what was happening in the churches? First of all, you had someone coming into the churches. I mean, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Someone would come in and they would say, I was on my way to church and the water was up over the road and we stopped and prayed and God parted the waters and we drove right across that low water crossing, and then when we were through, God put the waters back together. Now you're going to look at that and you're going to say, as a novice, you'll look at that and you'll go, wow, it was a miracle. But you're supposed to be smarter than that. You can say, well, God could do it. Well, God can do anything. He, however, has chosen how He will work in every dispensation. And you can't make Him a liar. But my other point is this, to say, Churches were getting caught up in that. I can remember when I was in Granbury, people were going to this church and, and they had a guy come in and he was doing all of these miracles. And you know what the miracle was? He was changing their fillings in their teeth to gold. People were coming out of there saying, I went in with, with this regular filling, you know, the little silver looking filling that you get, and, and God, God changed their fillings to gold. Then you know what? As the meeting went on, it went on for months. And as it went on, you know what it was then? God not only was given, changing their fillings to gold, He was giving people gold fillings that didn't even have any fillings. Now, you say, well, what, what did you think about that? Fables. Fables. That's the nice word. Fables. You believed a lie. Fables. Here's the thing, if God was going to perform a miracle, He wouldn't change your feelings to gold, what would He do? He'd just give you your real tooth back, wouldn't He? I've got to tell you, filled up with platinum, I don't care. I don't need any more holes in my teeth. That's ridiculous, isn't it? 
But that's what people do. And they think that glorifies him. Paul said, fables, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than what? There's the thing you're supposed to be. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, and then look at those last two words. So do. That's the thing you're to be doing. That's one of about a dozen references you find in the pastoral epistles that tell you the job of the pastor of the local assembly. Don't get your people off involved in that. They get off in that. They'll never be edified. They'll never learn to think and live and labor with their father. All right, now, just, just to kind of get ourselves back on the track here, whoo, look into that time. This is great, isn't it? I don't know where you are on your, but I'm on page two of my notes. This is just not working out. I know Randy's giving me that I told you so sign. You know, he, you know I was going to do three sessions today, and he went, why do you even pretend you're going to get that done? You know you're not. It's probably right. Romans 8, 14. Here's where we got off on it. You know, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. What is the spirit of bondage? The there you go. The law. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. It's a whole different way. All right, now I know that you folks have certainly, you, you, you followed this all the way up to a point. But that thing about adoption I need you to see that as more than an event that happened when you got saved. I need you to see that as a status. A status. When Milt and Barbara got married, Milt's status changed. And he's happy about that. He better be, right, yeah, because he's in it. His status changed. And that's something that, it's not just the wedding, it's not just the one-time event, but now that's something he's got to live out of every day. Well, that's the way I want you to see adoption. Don't just think of it as, the day I got saved, I got adopted. Think of it as something now that you've got to live out of every single day and, and let that really occur in your mind what it is that, that God has done with that. I, want to, I also want to take you to another scripture in Romans chapter 3. I'm just looking at the time here, what I've got left. Uh, you know, give me just a second. I just need, let me just, just give me a second. Have you got that color chart in your notes? It says Sonship Curriculum. Okay. Uh, let me do one thing. What I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to get to that chart in the just a few minutes we have left. You have the reason I want to do this is because I want to dispel the idea. There are grace preachers out there that understand there's an Israel program and a mystery program. And they understand that what God is doing with Israel is for this earth and eternity, and what He's doing with the body of Christ is going to be in the heavenly place for eternity. They understand all of that. But the reason that they don't get on to the sonship education, the reason they don't, is because of what we have already done. We went back when we read that word adoption and there was no explanation given to us to explain that term and it's the first time Paul mentions it and he doesn't enlarge on it or explain it or define it I've been telling you rightly so that the only way that you what you're supposed to do once you see a term like that is you know what you have to go back there's something that was given to you before that would cause you to understand what he means by that. The only place you can go back to, this is the book of Romans. It's the first of Paul's epistles. And if that's the first time it comes up, you know you're going to have to go back into what program to see it. To Israel's program. Saying that right there is enough for most people to close it up. I, they're not grace people because 
They're going back into Israel's program. And the, 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 the nail I need to drive home for you is, we are not going back to get Israel's program doctrine. We have avoided that. The only thing we've really done is go back and look at, because we found out in Romans 9.3, the adoption pertaineth to who? To Israel. So Israel had an adoption. It's almost like Paul's telling you that. So if you read this and you didn't know what I was talking about, go back over there and see it. Does, does he ever take you back? Sure he does. And let me give you that example. Therefore we conclude, is that right? No. Yeah. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it as one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. You see those two words? Those are different for a reason. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now, we look back, that's Romans 3. We went through all those verses there. You may be a little rusty on it. You can go back, look at your notes, and refresh yourself on that. But when Paul gets ready to defend this conclusion that he comes to, that we're not making void the law, but what we're doing is we're seeing that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. When he gets ready to defend that, look where he goes. What shall we say then that Abraham our father... This is the very next verse, by the way. You ran out of chapter 3 right there. The very next verse is chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh of the found? Well, if you're talking about Abraham, whose program are you in? You're in Israel's. And so to defend it, to defend his conclusion, you know what he's going to do? He's going to go back to Abraham and show you something. Now, is he going to put Israel program doctrine on anybody? Of course not. Is what we're doing any different than what our apostle did? No, that's, what, that's the point I've got to get across here because anybody that does understand grace, this is their sticking point right here. Verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Here's illustration number two. Even as David also. Where is David? He's in the Israel program. Now if my apostle can go back, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, did he define who Abraham was? B look back here. Did he tell you who Abraham was? He took for granted you knew that, didn't he? How in the world would you have known it? You'd have to go back over there and read it, wouldn't you? See, there are some guys, you need to understand this, that only take 13 epistles from Romans to Philemon... And they will never, ever, ever venture out of those 13 epistles one time every Sunday. They'll never do what we've done. They'll never go back and see Israel coming out of Egypt. They'll never look at the education where they were supposed to understand that God wanted to deal with them by Jehovah's and grace. They'll never talk about the crossing of the Red Sea and what that was about and God congealing the top of the pit so that they didn't go in. They'll never talk about what those five trials on their way. They won't go to Leviticus 26 and see the cycles of judgment. They won't go into any of that. Any of that because that doesn't belong, that doesn't belong to us. But you know what Paul is going to come along and say, and I, I, we're just not going to get to the verse, but he is going to talk about they are our example. And then in the very same verse, or maybe the next verse, he's going to say, and the things that happened to them are our in-sample. He's going to, what is that? Did you find it? We did that. Okay. And so, he. If he can say that they're our example and the things that happened to them were for our end sample, you have to go back and know what that is. That, that, that is the reason sonship is not going any further in this country. 
Because the preachers that understand a little bit about right division are deaf on going back. You can't do that. All right, so the last thing I want to give you here is, and we, we're in this thing with Abraham, and, 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 and we don't need to complete this thing. In fact, we're out of time. I can't get you. What we'll do is we'll take this up next time, and we'll look at that chart, because that's really where I needed to get you to. So